Welcome, Adam from KPH. Thank you very much, uh, Grace. Uh, thank you to our hosts for inviting us, and thank you for the sponsors for making this possible. Uh, actually, uh, I was always hoping, you know, throughout my career, that there would be a Nordic project. Once, so usually it's an EU project or some other. So there's no shortage of projects, but this is actually the first Nordic project uh, we're in. And uh, after 40 years in the business, well, it it arrived finally. So. Thank you. Uh, I'll just get you started this after lunch, so you may be a little bit uh, dozy, and so I'll try to be keep you awake. Uh, but I will warn you, the nice pictures that you saw from the previous, I don't have so many nice pictures. <laughs> and I'll be whining. So I'll be talking about my presentation. It's about digitalization building services and an integrated approach to building performance management. And it's true, so I'll be talking about that. But I'll mainly be talking about non-performance and whining about non-performance. So I'll be a bad cop, but then I'll connect with the good cops who showed you visions of the future and we, we can do it all. And, and I believe we can. And uh, I'll, I hope I will convince you that after the whining, there is sunshine actually, we have it now. And it's uh, we can get our buildings to work, but we have to do some things first. So let me get you started on that. Okay, technology first. Right, uh, just a few words. Uh, you've probably seen the papers or so not cared about them. Uh, my whole career, HVAC, uh, indoor climate and energy systems. So it's uh, indoor environmental quality and energy efficiency in buildings uh, and enclosed spaces. So I work with airplanes, I work with hotels, I work with uh, all kinds of hospitals, uh, all kinds of enclosed, not uh, even moving uh, sort of enclosed spaces. That's kind of the whole career. At this stage, uh, I'm interested in uh, digitalization because uh, I would say I've not been excited in my career for a long time as I am now because of the sudden possibility to quickly and efficiently deal with large amounts of data. Because we need data to know what we need to do with buildings. Food, and I'll tell you, to tell you more about that. So I think this digitalization, if you look at it in a clever way and use it wisely, uh, I think it can open up many opportunities. Right, okay. So I meet my students at the master level. Uh, they, uh, I meet them, actually I meet the first batch tomorrow, starting a course. And then I always, you know, uh, I introduce a little bit about the indoor climate and blah, 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 and different things. And then I ask them, so why should we care, you know, about building performance? And I would say, you know, the, the youth today, they're much more, there's much more information around, <clears throat> so they can't prepare. So they tell me a lot of things which we actually would like to teach them. So I say, oh, energy efficiency is important and how we use energy. And it's not uh, some of them, you know, the really advanced one. They say it's not just energy, it's also the power. Oh, I'm impressed. Great. That's great of you. Then they go on, they are so indoctrinated in a good way, educated about emissions and you know what we do to the environment and how we live as modern societies and what we need to do to get back on track. So emissions are central, they know all about it. So that's fantastic. They talk to me about decarbonization, projects I haven't heard about, climate change and so on. So that's very encouraging. I guess that's why they <clears throat> take the classes because they believe in this. And then they go on about resource use, materials use, water use, and so on. So we really have a good productive discourse from the beginning. But nobody in my 40 years of teaching has ever said a word about the people in those first talks. It's all environment, technology, possibilities, gimmicks, uh, all different things. And it really is all about what we do in buildings. First and foremost is to provide a good indoor environment to people, that's number one. So that's kind of the tune I would like to sing to now in the next few slides I'd like to share. This is a truth which we have known for, you know, I would say uh, 30 years. Uh, and what this graph eventually, when it blooms up, it will show you, I hope, uh, is the operational costs uh, that we know are in large office buildings. So we will compare different operational costs in large office buildings. So what would you say if I ask you, what is the biggest expense in a large office building? 
I know you know. Yes, the ventilation. Uh, it can be costly, yes. It can be costly, 20, 25% sometimes, depending on building, but it's not the biggest thing. So what happens in a big office building and what causes the biggest cost? And now you think outside the box, it doesn't have to be related to the building management. It's just the cost which happens in the building because of something else. Yes. Salaries. Salaries. Nobel Prize, exactly. <laughs> That's it, salaries. So we have a lot of these clever, talented, hardworking people sitting in these expensive offices uh, and we pay them good salaries. Look at, just imagine to extra to make it extra clear, look at the Google office. They all make you know, huge amounts of money for what they do. So they want to be happy and the employer wants to make everything. They want to make it cozy and organize. You, I, don't, I don't think I have to tell you, uh, you know, they have all this reputation of these very, very advanced and, you know, sort of uh, classy and, and comfortable and funky uh, office spaces that should stimulate them in their creativity, productivity, and what actually the employer wants out of them, that they should perform and carry out the job. So the people are the biggest cost. Compared to people, the facility management costs, that's electricity, that's water, that's everything that we need. Uh, not, not electricity, sorry, but the management of the building. So the control, just maintenance and everything is about 10%. You will probably find a building where it's 8%, so okay, it's 8%, or well, you'll find one which is 13%, so okay, it's 13%, but it's not 20 and it's not 30, it's around 10%. So it's about one tenth of the expense of what we pay to working people. And then the energy cost is yet one tenth, one ten times less. So the cost of energy of really making a building work, now the energy cost has gone up for a while in Sweden, so we had an expensive period, so maybe it was 2%, but it's not 5 and it's not 10. So we have the ratio of 100 to 10 to 1. So what do you want to invest? Where is your biggest value? Right? It's probably here. So, I will say when we talk about people, there's something called occupant satisfaction. Are you happy? I'm not. I'm not asking why. I'm just, are you happy? Are you satisfied at your work events? There's something called well being, which you can define different ways, but it's a slightly different. It's connected, but it's slightly different, more physical, maybe, or psychologically. And then we have something called productivity, also related to the people who paid those salaries to work. And then we also know that if people are satisfied, uh, that affects their well-being positively. And every one of these arrows that I will be showing you represent maybe hundreds of papers in literature over 30 years. So this is not new stuff. This is very, very old stuff. So, Happy and satisfied occupants are in a better state of well-being, and they are surprised, more productive. And we can then directly say that satisfied customers are more product productive. So what you want to do is, you, as an employer, you want to make sure that they work in an environment which provides them the needs or satisfies the needs to be satisfied, to be well-being, and to be able to, to operate productively. Then there's something called indoor environmental quality. So that's the quality of lighting, quality of air, it's called acoustic quality, and then thermal comfort. So we know another set of hundreds of papers that have just looked at that connection, the environment quality and satisfaction, clear case. If we have a high quality of indoor environmental quality, then we have high satisfaction, we have high level of well-being, we have high productivity. And then we have, of course, happier people. So indoor environmental quality has a huge impact on people through these three mechanisms. It has also an impact on uh, the energy cost. But as you can see, the cost is 100 to 1. So I think I'm trying to state the case that your best investment that you can make, to, that you can make either if you're renting for your employees or if you're running a building, uh, you should be investing in the indoor quality. It's the best return on investment you can get in the building. 
And here are some figures again uh, to show you how productivity is enhanced by different aspects of the indoor environmental quality. Uh, if you just look at thermal comfort, so if it's too hot, too warm, or none of those, you are in nice thermal balance. Uh, that can affect you, say, between 8 and 10 percent impact on productivity enhancement, so you can increase. Ventilation is slightly less, but it's right about there. Air quality and so on. So we have a clear case and thousands of paper when you sum all that up that have been really on the bandwagon and talking about this and talking about it. And this has not penetrated yet uh, practice because indoor, uh, the management of indoor environment is still sometimes perceived as something exotic. We are still, we continue focusing on energy efficiency, which is great, we should, and on emissions and all that. But first and foremost is the product. The energy is only a tool to deliver a service, which is a good indoor environment. That's what we want. On the way, we use some energy. Well, we should use it efficiently. We should not emit uh, too many emissions, of course. But number one is the delivery of a good environment. And buildings are human technical systems. So for the last 40 years, we have been in the business of optimizing the technical uh, properties of the building. Uh, efficiency of uh, windows, efficiency of walls, insulation, uh, and so on, whatever, heating, cooling, lighting, and so on. So it's unrealistic to expect that we can optimize the function of a human technical system by only focusing on technology. We have to involve humans. We need the data on humans, how what we are doing in the building actually affects uh, the users, how they perceive it. Some of it may be objective, which we can measure. Some of it can be subjective, uh, because we can be told what they feel is good, is bad, or some uh, in between. So that's the kind of part I've always wondered, how can that be? These are highly talented people who have been doing advanced optimizations, but they just forgot the key factor. It's just not in the game. Very, very fun. So we have a big lack of data, of course, on uh, how uh, actually uh, the perception of thermal comfort in indoor environmental quality uh, figures uh, in the, on the quality of the performance of the building. So that means that <clears throat> the user-related data to uh, comfort level related to satisfaction, well-being, productivity, and so on, is needed for a wholesome, integrated, data-driven building performance assessment. Enter on the stage GDPR, right? Who doesn't know what GDPR is? You all do. And that's a big roadblock, uh, but it's not an impossible roadblock. We have made it, and uh, sometimes it's an excuse to not do something about it, but actually there are very good ways around that. And, We've been discussing how we could be addressing that. But there is a lack of data, and we need to get that data. And we also need not just to get the data, but we need this to satisfy certain expectations on us and on the building. So there are standards which we have to fulfill. Uh, ISO 7070, 730, and National Standard 55, depending on where you are, uh, requirements on indoor environmental. Uh, quality, uh, energy performance, it could be uh, at the county level or municipality level or city level or country level, they're different, but we have regulations and expectations to fulfill. You may have a contract with somebody you are sort of, uh, you are renting or somebody is renting to you, certain full obligations have to be fulfilled, so you have to measure, you have to have data, have we fulfilled that or not. Compliance with green uh, building certification uh, requirements. Then we have the new big paradigm shift of the taxonomy. For maybe 25 years, we've been focusing on regulating the use of energy and energy efficiency in buildings. But we're actually transitioning now into focusing on emissions. Of course, this is related, but it's a completely different approach, actually entailing a completely different set of measures that you would need to pursue in achieving carbon neutrality. So achieving a certain level of energy efficiency is not the same as achieving a certain level of carbon neutrality. So this is a big challenge that we need to uh, 
make buildings comply with. Then we have sustainable development goals, national and so on. I will not bother you with all of these. This is just to say that we have a huge plethora of regulations, standards, laws, expectations, contractual obligations that actually force us to comply with specific regulations. Very few or almost none of them relate to the most important thing, which we found was the best return on investment, and that's the happiness, well-being and productivity of the user. Very, very strange, isn't it? So the taxonomy, which I'm sure you all know, is the, uh, well, it's not new, but it's reasonably new, uh, instrument which is uh, the EU is using to scale up sustainable investment in sustainable activities in order to achieve the uh, carbon neutrality by 2050. And again, the paradigm shift is we are, of course, keeping focus on this. We are not forgetting about this, but the key focus is how to achieve this. And then, of course, this needs to be managed along the way. We also have a new toy that the uh, European Union has generated, the uh, Smart Readiness Indicator, which is supposed to give you a full information in the context of seven parameters uh, of you know, how, uh, how, how smart the building is. And the, the, this parameter is a single value, which is then uh, compound by seven uh, different categories, which are energy, like energy efficiency, or how flexibly the building can connect to the grid, uh, how comfortable it is. So here, some of that information on users comes in, but it's not defined how it will be measured. So it's just this, you know, uh, it's just in the air. Convenience, uh, if you look at what how that is defined, it's also very fuzzy. Uh, Well-being and health is also defined, but in some places they define it as the availability of vegetarian restaurants in a uh, in a uh, office building complex. It's very good, but it, it can get very exotic. So I'm not trying to ridicule this at all. There are many good people who are thinking about this. There is a reason and there is a big push by the industry to do this. So this is really coming from there. Uh, I'm not uh, one big supporter of the smart readiness indicator, mainly because we do not have really good data which we should put in here, and we do not have the and we in, there is no methodology which really has been thought through in how this data then should be aggregated to be uh, to produce a single number that will then now allow us to compare and benchmark buildings in a just an equitable way. So I don't quite trust the way this is going, but maybe in a few years we will see uh, some solution. So it's just a fuzzy indicator, but it will be rolled out and we will have to comply with this. So the old truth, if you can't measure it, uh, engineering truth, I'm uh, an engineer, uh, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. It's quite simple as that. So you need data, you need information. And you need to be clever about what information. You don't need to have 50,000 sensors if you know exactly what you should measure for your type of building. But whichever way it is, you need some data on the building and you need some data, I claim, on the users. So if you look at this, this would be your typical new kind of building in the center of one of our uh, parts of the city districts. Uh, Multi-purpose building, which uh, one part is uh, one part is residential at the back, and then you have some office space. Uh, you have a shopping center or a food store. I think there was a gym around there. So multi multi-purpose building. And what do we measure today? So before I start whining, we have no data. It's not quite that we have no data, but we have very little valuable data many times. So we typically measure energy performance at kilowatt hours per square meter a year, very primitively. Uh, almost never any annual and sort of year-long information on the power need and power variations and so on. So it's a very, very simplistic just figure, you know, and you just write it down, that's it, you, you supply with the regulations. So this tells us the way this is measured today tells us nothing about how the building actually should be managed. It provides no feedback for whoever is the facility manager. 
economic performance, we have a lot of figures on because everybody's interested in the bottom line, how much does it cost, right? So everybody knows the electricity costs and so on. But then you start poking and say, okay, could you break this down? Because I would like to know how much you spend on cooling, how much you spend. Oh, sorry, oh, we don't have the submeters, we don't measure that. So even the economic is really uh, an economic data in terms of cost management, but it's not about the connection to the building performance. It provides very little information unless you have advanced algorithms, which you know can be designed and on a certain position, which can help you to disaggregate and understand. Okay, this much goes for lighting, this much goes for hot water, and so on. It is possible, but you will never get the sufficiently exact by claim uh, information as if you submeter at the appropriate level. Environmental impact is really uh, luxury. That's uh, rarely done. Maybe <clears throat> during a certification, you can do that for, uh, say, green building or lead or green, and then you have to fulfill specific information, fill it in, submit it, and then you get a certain grade. So some, some of that can be measured, uh, but it's not something we measure continuously, like the CO2 emissions or whichever else, whatever else could be interesting. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, user inspection is never mentioned unless there is a complaint. There's somebody who's right, like me, right now. Then, if there are sufficient number of them, then so okay, maybe you have to do something about it. Then they get in a consultant, and there's a big questionnaire, and they go around and write down, and then they come up with a solution. And things are forgotten probably after a month. Yeah. Re rarely there is a major solution improvement. I'm not saying that sometimes they can't do something, but there is no continuous. We have some continuous measurement of energy. Uh, we have quite a lot of continuous measurement of economic, of cost. We have no continuous measurement of the impact or the satisfaction on the users. And on the indoor climate, we sometimes measure temperatures. We rarely sometimes measure humidity levels. We very rarely measure operative temperatures or and even more rarely effective temperatures. So our understanding of the indoor climate is very, very poor. And there is very, very little uh, in, in this verified universe, there is very, very little continuous data. So what we clearly lack is data. You know, this data-driven example is talking about digitalization. Oh, we have this data, this and that and the other, and then we can aggregate, analyze and all this, and it will save the world. And my question, I sit down and say, this sounds great. Where is the data? Which data are you talking about? Where are you collecting that data? Then they point at some experimental high performance building that received 15 prizes. Uh, sure, and what about the 15 million other buildings? That's the situation that we have today. So what we need really is a uh, database. There is a lack of high quality data, lack of long term measurements of building performance. And we cannot only measure, I really claim that, continue measuring technical data, uh, energy use or whatever else you want, but we also have to collect data and the connection between what that energy actually delivers in terms of service quality to the user. Because that's, at the end of the day, that's the only thing I'm interested in. But, you know, I, I don't have a radiator to be happy that the radiator is efficient if I'm not warm enough or if I'm too warm. So I want to have a measure of the energy expended and other sort of resources used to deliver that service. That connection is not obvious or presented today. And we should do that not for one building, but I'd be happy that we have a database, Nordic maybe, where we have data that we could exchange on thousands of buildings, hospitals, residential, uh, and so on, so that we can start learning and collecting that data and understand how from learning and analyzing the performance of these buildings, how we should build future buildings and how we should run the existing ones in a better way. But without data, we can't do that. That's, that's a given. So we need data, we need uh, technical data and biometric data. And we of course need to comply with GDPR, the law. But there are ways I think for innovative so this is a challenge, which I think is quite exciting. And that together would then produce a long-term database of user and building related 
response data, which can be analyzed. And the feedback of that analysis could be then driven to some kind of data-driven performance management tool that will help us understanding all this. Okay, we know about the users, we know about all the technical things. We aggregate this and see, at the end of the day, I need to see to send the signal to something or say, okay, well, we should improve the heating here. Ventilation is not good. The lighting is bad there. Too much humidity in the um, shower room or something like that. It could be many other things. And with that better data, in the future, we could then understand from past performance better how we should equip, equip future buildings with technology and instrumentation and HVAC what type of systems work with what buildings and in, under what context. So this is a lot of money is wasted on bad systems that do not perform and have to ripped out or be adjusted. We would learn how to better simulate our buildings. So there's a typically we make indoor climate and uh, energy simulations today. There's typically a mismatch of minimum five to 10% of what it is in terms of what is simulated and what you get in reality. By Getting good, high quality, high resolution data, we could actually learn to improve our simulation tools, learn from that, and maybe correct themselves for specific type of buildings. We could, of course, oops, see. We could, of course, look at the users not only as a beneficiary. Of course, we are delivering the service, but it's an interactive system. You have a responsibility and you have rights. It's like everywhere. So if you are a user, maybe I can do something as a user, which is more clever for this building in this situation. Maybe I can do something to operate the window shades, or I can maybe uh, set the temperature to some other level or do something behaviorally, <clears throat> which would improve the performance. So this would be feedback actually to the users and be educational. And then we have, I'll not explain to that, but we can connect all this with BIM systems where you know, we use BIM systems that are proposed to be used as repositories of pretty much all the building information that could be used. And there are uh, like two fields, two camps. One camp says, no, BIM was not designed ever to be used as a tool for facility management. And I belong to the other camp and say, why? Why not? Why should you not have one data base for building data, which we already have in many cases, so in increasing number of cases, and then educate that data with performance data. That it's all in one place. I'll leave it there because that's a big discussion itself. And then of course, with all this, we could have a better performance control of buildings, which would result in hopefully better Building performance, it's a hopefully a positive loop. And what would that result in then? We would have, for instance, higher building certification level because we can make sure that the building is not only certified every two years, but I could tell you, is it gold today? From the three o'clock on Tuesday, or is it silver next week because we are cooling and the cooling part takes everything down? So I want to know the details, performance, not just a little placket you put there, but I want to know how does it breathe, how does it live every day, every second, and how can it be tweaked for the benefit ultimately of the user. And then obviously for higher user value, satisfaction, well-being, productivity, uh, better adaptive behavior, a higher market value, of course, higher level of energy security, better compliance with EPVD and other energy regulating tools, and of course taxonomy eventually also, uh, and also better energy performance rate. And these are just a few. I think if we sat here uh, an hour and brainstorm, I probably would have a list of 50 other issues which we could improve in the building in terms of building performance if we had better data, which would help us do the things that we should be doing anyway. So this is kind of the, the, the good picture that it can be done, but you can't drive a car without the petrol. And the petrol for this is data. 
and the petrol for this is good data. We want to have a good driver. So again, coming to back to where I started, so I'm still excited day by day more. By digitalization, it scares me because it's I'm a mechanical engineer, so it's a steep learning curve, you know, AI and all these things, but it, it can be learned, so that's encouraging. Even at 62 is fine, but the ability to deal with immense amounts of data from different streams and then cross correlate them and understand what is actually the relevant way of expressing a building performance. And would arrive quickly that it's not kilowatt hours per square meter and you tell you anything. So what's needed is a user centric. This was a big long uh, declaration system oriented. Sorry about this typo. Data driven, large on automated, which means enough, not too much, not overdoing it, just enough, at the right level of automation, methodology for building performance assessment and management. And then always keep your focus, you know, whenever you drive, keep your eye on the road. Our road is the users. Always keep an eye on the benefit to the users. That should be our key driver in this context of building performance management. Well, now I line a little bit more. Because we have gaps, we have lacks of data. So we have something which is the data gap. And what happens in most buildings, we don't have quality issue data, I would just say good data, usable data. It's just not there. We do typically not plan in the planning process, design process, operation process, facility management planning process. We do not plan for measurements of this kind, advanced kind, uh, not in the early phases, not at any time. So we just don't get that into the system. And if it's not budgeted, as you know, with everything in life, it won't happen. Because if we don't put that value to what we're doing, and if we're not prepared to pay it for that value in some form, well, how why should it happen in a market society, right? So, there is no unified or standardized approach to collecting data. So everybody, every building pretty much is doing it. Those that do it, those few, do it in their own ways. Oftentimes, you can't exchange data because it's legacy equipment. 20 years old, 10 years old, they send you a batch of data and so oh, what's the gibberish? I don't even have a system which can translate to something. This is linear, this is standard case. Uh, there is no unified or standardized approach to comparing or benchmarking. So even if you get that data, let's say that, okay, all the data is compatible now, now we have 10 buildings. We have no way of really comparing uh, all the parameters that we would like to compare. And I think all this, would happen if we started collecting, and I think it would be a gestation time. This would happen overnight, but we need to accumulate a really good database of performance data, where then after a while we could provide answers to these uh, issues that are raised. And of course, which is surprising, there is no mandatory requirement for continuous real-time or human-centric data-driven building performance management. There are some requirements. If you read the EPBD, you will find you know, we have to do this and that together. But that doesn't take you even to the first floor of the 150 store building that actually, you know, would be the counterpart, the, uh, the uh, amount of effort that would be, need to be done. So the reality for most buildings is no long-term performance data available. Uh, data is incomplete of low quality. Data access is often restricted because you have the negative press uh, or the negative publicity. Oh, what are you doing with the data and why are you going to share it with and how will this reflect on our business and I'll stop it. So it's a bit, this is one of the big roadblocks. So we can't even get data from even our best partners many times. I, I work at KTH University, so we work with many facility management companies and many stakeholders in the business, in the uh, private sector excellent contacts and a lot of joint projects. But when it comes to getting data that we would like to share with board, to be able to you know, fill around with it and do something good with it, uh, that's where it quickly stops oftentimes. And then we have the issue about the formats, which I already mentioned, that you know the formatting of data is oftentimes uh, done in ways that it's just let, does not lend itself to, to be prepared. So the cleaning and the conversion and the adaptation of that is costly. It's it's a pain in the process. 
And then there's the issue of knowledge. Somebody has to do this. We have, you know, some people when we talk about this who don't crazy, but most people or many people uh, in the field don't even understand what we're talking about. So the level of education, and this is not a criticism, this is a wish for us to do something, um, to elevate the understanding of what it means to talk about wholesome performance and integrated performance. So, because you have to address many, many things which are mandated that you should be doing, uh, that it's not done today, and simply without the appropriate training, we don't have that. So the lack of training is an opportunity for us and other stakeholders to actually act on that. So as a result, most buildings do not perform as expected, and sadly, I mean, uh, probably likely never will, but some will. And you know, there, is, there is a light somewhere there. Uh, so there is a performance gap. 75% of all new buildings we in so 75% of our best performing buildings are not performing to contract, to certification level, to, to whatever was meant to be achieved. 75% of the best buildings that we have in building in Sweden. So this is not a small problem, it's, it's, that's the reality. And then non-compliance with either predicted, simulated, or contracted, agreed, uh, or otherwise required aspects and levels of building performance can result in a wide range of problems. I will mention only some. Uh, excessive energy use, of course. Uh, emissions are increased and other greenhouse gases. Uh, it leads to higher costs and bigger problems with costly and time-consuming maintenance uh, and hunting for where is the problem. Uh, operational startup loss, of course. Uh, subpar quality of building functions and services. Uh, and all that leads to uh, bad indoor environmental quality. Uh, we have component and system faults. Uh, we have difficulties in achieving uh, targeted certification levels. Uh, unhappy users, of course, uh, mismatch with business case that are, people are sued. But in Scandinavia, we don't have this, fortunately, tradition of suing each other at the same level as it happens, say, in the US, North America, and elsewhere. But there are very expensive suits that can happen from you promising that you will keep the temperature between 21 and 23, and then for some reason you don't do it. And I've seen some of those, uh, and uh, it can be a very uh, costly issue. So the issue here is what do we need to do? We need to close the performance gap by closing the, filling the data gap. So we need more data, and it's just, a, you know, on the floor, we just need to start connecting it, defining what we want to measure, measuring it properly, accumulating it, and then really processing and learning from it. And once we have that, then over time, I'm sure we will, able to, we will be able to perform better. There is another issue also. We focus on the wrong many times, key performance indicators, which are kilowatt hour per square meter and year, or sometimes uh, kilowatt for electricity use uh, installed power in Sweden. So I would say that we need to rethink the way we evaluate the value that is generated in terms of building services uh, by thinking how the resources that have been used actually result in a benefit to users. So measure what we need to know rather than what we are using, used to measuring and have been doing for the last 20 years. Oh, I think I, uh, right, there we go. I'll learn from both. So we need to understand much more transparently and clearly the relationships between resources like energy use uh, and investments made, cost, how much did we pay for that, and the level of service achieved. How happy was I with your the indoor environment that you've developed, uh, developed uh, delivered to me. So the actual mean vote or the actual percent dissatisfied, uh, we can take that. I I'll hope you'll bear with me. That is a measure of the uh, of the uh, actual uh, satisfaction level with an indoor environment, which can be asked by questionnaire, for instance, or can be done interactively, can be done digitally. Uh, but that should be measured per kilowatt hour or kilowatt used. So you should put the use of the energy in relation to what did you deliver. We're not thinking that way today. We're just thinking per square meter. So per square meter, I could live in a small apartment, big apartment, doesn't say anything about what I 
perceived as a user. We could do the same for domestic hot water uh, delivered per user served, uh, or uh, also energy, heating and cooling energy delivered per user served. So if you have five people living in an apartment and you use a certain amount of energy, if you use the same amount of energy in the same apartment for only one person, well, that's a question you know that needs to be asked, and so on. So there are many other ways of connecting this, but the critical point is to detach ourselves from just measuring physical parameters and measuring rather the compound parameters which relate uh, specific physical values uh, to the benefit to generate to users upon uh, the base of what building service we are looking at. So it could be lighting, it could be cooling, it could be heating, it could be air quality, it has or the amount of CO2 emitted. There is another missing link, and I think that's one of the biggest hindrances that we have. That's the fact we have not really made uh, a valued proposition throughout all these years. Uh, indoor climate does not carry a very measurable marketable value, I would say. So but when you talk to people, oh, of course, I understand what uh, the indoor environment is important. It's good for your health. You should be constantly should be productive. Everybody understands. So, OK, wait a minute. So everybody understands it. How do we put that, take that into our business model? Who, how do we get people who get that service and are happy about it to actually pay? And I'm not talking about in exploiting people, not at all, but relating what you are paying for, for your, say, housing or whatever, uh, wherever you are paying rent or space you're using, relating that to your level of satisfaction and to your level of happiness with the service that has been delivered to you. This is science fiction today. Uh, so unless we put a price on a good indoor environment, it just won't happen in the, the way we deal with things today. So we uh, did actually a uh, study uh, some years ago, uh, a EU project, where we uh, went through a lot of data, uh, a, lot of, a lot of literature, and tried to find uh, traces that would connect or arguments that would connect good building performance and good economic performance. So to find the way we were looking for, could we actually find this new uh, missing link and express it that if you drive a building certain way, then you can get a better return on investment, you can get measurable increased cash flow, you can get a measurable decreased operational costs, you can have a lower investment risk and so on. Investment risk could be, for instance, you get a better, cheaper loan for the building you're developing because you show that the building is performing well, it's green, it's has satisfied users and so on. So this is key. In our market society, unless you can price tag a service, it's not just about the quality, which, I mean, oh, we're happy, yes, it's nice air, but unless there is a measurable value in the equation, uh, it's very difficult to make it happen. So how to attract much needed capital to sustainable building projects, either if it's retrofitting, if, which is the most case, 99%, yes, is it one minute? Okay, right. Uh, so uh, I will just uh, mention that we uh, summarize this, in, we have a report uh, that was written here, and I can uh, recommend you to uh, have a look at it if you have a chance. Uh, we did not find the equation. So the holy grail is still out there to be found. But we have found a lot of interesting information that actually connects and explains how uh, different stakeholders think and how investors in the real estate market have a completely different perception of value. And they will invest in the indoor environment. That is clearly shown if you can document actually that it generates uh, value for them. Right. So can smart technologies help? Well, uh, yes, they can, if they are used with a clear understanding of the purpose, not just because Siemens is selling them or because everybody else is buying it, but because you understand that for the need in your specific building, this can be an advantage at the level that you need, and then you buy just that level and install. And this is equally true for a building and connecting to what Bo was talking about, this is another exciting thing that now things are really easier to get upscaled. It's a lot of work and a lot of learning curves, of course, but we are now talking of smart cities, smart districts, smart, you know, so, so we can connect and achieve these same goals of good performance 
uh, at the district level uh, in the future, uh, as we uh, still have not uh, at the singular building level. But there are immense opportunities to do that. And there are different performance tasks, as Paul was talking about, you know, in cities, what we need to achieve. And if you go back to buildings, so that we have a different uh, set of tools. So I will skip this one. And so very quickly and finish on this uh, note. So basically in this sector, after all this whining, uh, what we really need, and that is both a challenge because it's hard work to get there and an opportunity uh, is data, data, data. And I'm talking high quality data, large scale, not just one billion. We need huge databases. We need to be able to work with them and have access to them, share them and learn from them. Uh, we need technical and user related data, full stop. This is not disrespectful to users. This is necessary. Uh, otherwise, we are working in a utopian uh, belief that we can optimize systems without even looking at one part of the equation. That doesn't work. Simple mathematics will show you that. So GDPR can be dealt with better key performance indicators, something that actually relates to service quality. Uh, focusing on what building users actually need and understanding, that could be hard work. You know, really policing and say, okay, here's the problem. This is what we need to solve and not what markets put for you. Find the sweet spot for Lago in Swedish. This is, you know, just the right level. Find what you really need and use that technology. It can be very simple sensors. It, can, it doesn't have to be advanced AI uh, driven stuff. Can be that too if needed, but it doesn't have to be. And I was saying most buildings it doesn't have to be. You just need good data. Uh, we need to convince markets. We will never get around that. This we have an, a proof of this being a good business. Uh, this will just remain for the next 30 years and just blah blah. So this needs to be established, and we are looking now at the project with the real estate department and uh, at our university to actually look at how we could deal with that in the uh, in the future. Education, 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 uh, and also uh, adequate interoperability for better system integration, large scale optimization, which means when we are dealing and dealing with this at building level, we should already be thinking about what does this mean for scaling up to the next level. Thank you very much. Start some online questions. Yeah, so we have one from Josh again. Maybe you could read it and then yes. show the context because it's a bit long. Okay. So thank you for an interesting presentation. It's uh, ah, okay. Based uh, on our previous collaboration between Casta University and Wasel University, okay, in Japan, uh, I'm wondering about your thoughts about the importance of the data processing pipeline. More specifically, how to structure and unstructure data in a standardized way. For example, the format data from the climate control is quite different from the lighting control. Okay. Uh, thank you, George, for this question. Uh, I'll say uh, this would be a little bit too complex uh, to, to answer this time, I think. Uh, I would very happily, I don't know if he sees me or he sees, you. He sees me here and gives me. Uh, Georg or George, uh, contact me and we can discuss about that. Yeah. Very good to answer. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, with one of your first slides, yeah. uh, you show, um, I mean, the, the real cost of a building. Yeah. And I know the answer is because I paid the salary building. So I don't know what the cost is. Um, and it's clearly salary that it is uh, the biggest cost per square meter. Uh, and of course, any kind of uncontrolled and you know, low productivity and so on. So, first of all, I mean, uh, that cost I, I had to pay them. But I think, I mean, the real problem is, yeah, I can't really do so much about it because uh, somebody else pays the um, electricity, but the heating, somebody else pays um, the maintenance. In various ways, yeah. right? So, so I think maybe uh, at least for I don't know what the difference you know, one of the big barriers into is that uh, the person who really paid the biggest part of the bill 
have very little to say or nothing to say. Yes. Actually, on, on the other part of yeah. the film. So, and it's, it's really bad in the public sector. Uh, because I learned that, you know, one box of money yeah. takes care of innovation, another box of money in a totally different department in the ministry or in the municipality and so on actually pays the salary. Yes. So, and there's no way of trust management. Yeah. Probably also trust management. When you mention Google, maybe it's easier for them because they have to build their own headphones around the whole mm. country because they have a more direct pipeline. Mm. So somehow I think my, my, my question is, what do we do about it? Because uh -huh. uh, we really want to focus on the real quality in terms of the good for climate. We somehow actually need to link actually, you know, who has to pay, yeah. who has to gain, but the other people need to get on board. Right. Uh, exactly as you say, it, I, I have no other view of it. Uh, we call it the split interests, so it's very difficult to reconcile. Uh, I don't think markets solve things because markets are in the interest of markets and capital, but I think uh, that we, unless we put a price on the value of good service, we won't get anywhere. Uh, uh, and, and with that, I mean, uh, you can bring it back to rent. So Google has their own offices, but they're all rented. Uh, they, they own some, but, but few generally. So they, they do rent. And of course, there are. I should not confuse how cheat you that it's because Google is a brand. So everybody wants Google because they're a brand. So they will do special things for them. Uh, if it was companies, say, uh, ABC, Okay, your company ABC will do something, but then it might have a different connotation. And I, I will be vague here. I don't know at what level. So Google is maybe special, but there is data actually that uh, high performance certified buildings actually that they do command a higher uh, premium, so that they do have a lower turnover of guests. And not all of them, but uh, it's increased. And this is the lack of data. So what, what I say is in the few accounts that you know have been done in cases, there is emerging data that actually. Good performance commands a higher price uh, that people stay longer. Uh, it's word of mouth, and they inform you know others. So slowly it spreads about the market. But we're in baby shoes. You know the data and the cases that we have. This is the last five years. Uh, that's that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Follow up. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the presentation. Maybe the slide you were mentioning that there's maybe a bit standardization and, and maybe also requirements like yeah. for energy and energy data around buildings. And no, I didn't say that. I said that there is actually a lot of regulation standardization that we have to meet. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it was a misunderstanding. So this was the one with a long list of requirements. Yeah. yeah. So all these were meant to say that uh, it's not just wishful thinking. Actually, there are a uh, uh, plethora of different levels and types of regulations and Expectations on us by laws, uh, standards, and so on that we have to comply with. But does it mean that we do not meet them actually, since we have so many issues? Uh, they are not enforced, many of them. So the standard yeah. uh, 7730, for instance, uh, as an example, the Indo climate standard, we must comply with it. That's quite uh, well explained. Uh, there is extremely rarely an, a follow up on that. There is a follow up if there's a complaint, and then you know you, you get the trolling. But there is no continuous data, or sufficiently continuous and good quality data that you could say, say, okay, do we comply today at three o'clock? I know we don't. Okay, let's do something about it. So that type of uh, operational follow up does not exist uh, on most of the long list of requirements. We do not have this data collected to show in real time that we are where we should be. Okay, okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Uh, um, so thank you for your presentation. I think a lot of the challenges you presented really resonated with me. Um, you spoke a bit about uh, the fact that there's at least yes, no unified or standardized approach to collect data uh, regarding building performance. And um, at the same time, uh, not all buildings are built equal. Um, but you also need to, uh, yeah, um, make something that is need based and operations friendly. And to satisfy something that is need based and operations friendly, and something that is also confined to a framework or a standard, there's a mismatch in terms of scalability, right? How can you try to standardize something uh, while at the same time you want to um, 
police a lot of things, so police a lot of people. And so I guess my question is, or maybe you could say a few things about how could you actually scale something like this? So maybe it's not necessarily a framework we need, but rather just a very loose guidelines or I don't know. Um, Are you thinking in terms of which data we might need to yeah. be able to make sure that we measure what we need to measure? Yeah, so to not measuring the data actually, like like attaching the components to right. it. Right. Okay. Because yeah. it's... I, I think I understood your question, so uh, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, so I think uh, it, it's like this. Uh, if you look at all the regulations that we should comply with, including the specific contracts and so on, there's tons of data, probably more, then we would actually need to show that we can achieve reasonably because we were talking about user-friendly something doable, right? So I'm not talking in anything that I'm mentioning here, some utopian best performing building, actually quite the opposite. Something that is reasonable, that is affordable, that is, but it should be complying with all the requirements. So there's no uh, pushing down, you know, key health uh, issues. And so it should be a reasonable building. So that's what I'm talking about. So there is enough data which are already pointed out that should be measured uh, in those regulations that if we started that, we could get a lot of data. There is a lot of data which is not in there, which is are these new KPIs, which we would like to form. I gave you just a quick shot of a few. We have a list of about 60 of them. Uh, that we would like to measure because they relate not to what was put in or some traditional way of doing it, but the value proposition, right? Because we want to build a value proposition which you can then also hopefully also put a price on and market. So there are there is additional data. And this is where digitalization comes in. We are not anymore, which we, during most of my career, I was scared about the amount of data that needs to be accessed, processed, understood, and then dealt with to achieve a small improvement. Now, if we if we improve the way we collect all that data, so the regulation data, the new API data, other data, and then cleverly, and maybe we could use AI or some other tool to actually learn what we need to measure, stress test buildings, let's find out what are the five, 10 key parameters for this building and measure that, right? In relation to what's required. So when you do performance evaluation, then you would say, okay, in relation to blah, 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 all these requirements, you have achieved this, 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 and that. And then you match them and then you find a way of aggregating and say, okay, you are level whatever, seven out of 10 or something like that. So, so we have the tools today, uh, but we are still, and we have sensors and we know how to do it. And there is a lot of good knowledge. It's just that we need to start collecting more data. Thank you.